Hi, I'm Caitlin, a podcast producer here at C-SPAN. This week on C-SPAN's Afterwards podcast, New York University professor Jonathan Haidt argues that technology is harming the social development and mental health of children. He's interviewed by Harvard University Center for Digital Driving co-director and author Emily Weinstein. Since March 19, 1979, C-SPAN, a public service funded by the cable television industry, began giving you direct access to government in an innovative way by putting you, the viewer, into the rooms where politics is debated and policies are determined. C-SPAN began as a bold initiative. Now, 45 years later, we are essential for those wanting to see democracy at work without editing or commentary. With continued cable support, we've done this without a dime of government funding, maintaining our independence. As we mark 45 years, the business of media is rapidly changing, and now your support is crucial for our mission's future. Support our legacy of unfiltered access by donating today at cspan.org slash donate. Thank you. This episode is brought to you by Shopify. Forget the frustration of picking commerce platforms when you switch your business to Shopify, the global commerce platform that supercharges your selling wherever you sell. With Shopify, you'll harness the same intuitive features, trusted apps, and powerful analytics used by the world's leading brands. Sign up today for your $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash tech, all lowercase. That's shopify.com slash tech. John, it's good to be with you today. I'm so looking forward to this conversation. We're here to talk about your new book, The Anxious Generation. I care a lot about adolescence. Um, I'm a social scientist, so I brought that lens to reading this book. I want to understand what's going on. I'm also a mom, so I really want reasons to be hopeful. Um, so those are some of the perspectives I had in reading the book. I'm curious what <laughs> lenses you brought to writing it. Um, so I'm I'm also a social scientist. I'm also a professor. I'm also a father. I have my my children are uh, I have a son, 17, and a daughter, 14. <clears throat> Um, and I, I said, you know, I, my own research is on the psychology of morality. I looked at um, how morality helps us understand the political divide. I've looked a lot at what social media is doing to democracy. Uh, I didn't set out to write a book on kids because that's not my expertise, although I have studied a lot of developmental psychology. Um, I set out to write a book on what social media is doing to our country and how it's making it difficult to have reasonable politics. And I thought I'd start the first chapter off with, well, what happened to teens when they moved their social lives onto, mm-hmm. onto, um, you know, onto their smartphones and social media around 2011, 2012? What happened to them? And then I was going to move on and then just talk about democracy. Um, but once I wrote that first chapter, I realized, oh, my God, this is I, I, the graphs are shocking. The, 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 the increase in mental illness is so vast and it happens in many countries. So anyway, so that drew me into it. And I, I think what I what I can bring, even though I'm not primarily a developmental psychologist or a clinical psychologist, is as a social psychologist, I'm really aware of and focused on how we influence each other. Mm. And you can't understand social media and the addiction to it and the difficulty of anyone stepping out unless you understand the social web that people are in, the incredible concerns that we all have about reputation, what people think of us. And how much more intense that is for teenagers. So I bring that. And oh, also, I'm in a business school. I, I moved to the NYU Stern School of Business in 2011. Um, I'm, uh, I was at the University of Virginia before then. Uh, and I've learned so much about business. I didn't know much about it before I came here because uh, we don't learn much about business or capitalism in, you know, in most of our schools. Um, and so understanding the business models that Facebook developed in particular, the, ad, the advertising-driven, engagement-maximizing business model, um, has also helped me to understand why we're in this deep, deep trap. Yeah, so talk to us a little bit about that business model, about the attention economy we're in, and how that factors into your thinking. Mm-hmm. So let's go back. I find it, you know, it's very helpful, especially for you know, older listeners who remember the 90s. Um, who remember the, how amazing it was when we first got got a web browser, when we first could like type in, you know, anything and Google will, or, you know, Next, uh, Alta Vista, I think was the original one, you know, would answer it. I mean, it was like we were gods, you know, you have omniscience, you, you can find anything. So the, you know, the early internet was incredible and the millennials grew up with it and it didn't harm their mental health at all. Um, their mental health is actually a little better than Gen X before them. Um, and it didn't harm democracy at all. In fact, it seemed to be uh, really helping democracy in, in the 90s. 
Um, so, so you know, we we all started off very optimistic um, about all of this. And a point that I, I come back to again and again in the anxious generation is that when smartphones and social media came in in the twenty in the two thousands, that really changed everything. Um, our, our relation to technology changed. The technology was no longer a servant that we called them when we needed something. But once we got smartphones with the app store and hundreds, thousands of apps and notifications, now there was the opportunity for companies to use us. There was the opportunity for Facebook, to, worked, out the, worked out the mechanics of this first. Originally, Facebook had no revenue. It was just, hey, you know, let's connect people and for free. That seemed wonderful. Um, but once they worked out the revenue model, which is that the, the people using the, the service are not the customers, they don't pay the money, they get a free service. Um, and if you're getting something for free on the internet, probably you're the product. Well, I shouldn't say that. There are cases where you get it for free. But in this case, um, if you're getting this company's service, you're actually the product, the customer is the advertiser. And once they develop that model, of free to use, but you pay with your data and your attention and your receptivity to advertisements. Uh, many other companies adopted it, and then the race was on. Whoever could grab a, a young person's eyeballs and hold on would win, but if you didn't grab them and hold on, someone else would. So you better be as addictive as possible, as engaging as possible. And that's why the early, you know, even in 2007, 2008, 2009, it wasn't bad. Like it, it wasn't hurting kids' mental health, but by 2015 it was. Uh, so that's the key turning point, that business model. And you write in the book about some changes to the technologies themselves that you feel like made a big difference. I know the front facing camera is one of them. Talk to us a little bit about some of some of what changed around then that you feel like has has had mm -hmm. such a big impact. Yes. So again, I didn't I didn't know this just from common knowledge. It wasn't until I first teamed up with Tobias Rose Stockwell, who has a wonderful book, Outrage uh, Outrage Machine. Uh, and then my research partner, Zach Rausch, really dug into it in detail. When you lay out the story of what changed technologically, it's a really amazing story. <clears throat> and so it starts um, in 2007 with the introduction of the iPhone. And there too, I remember my first iPhone. It was magical. I mean, it was like a digital Swiss army knife. It, it had all these amazing things on it. I could use it for all sorts of things. Uh, so I loved it. It was not harmful. My, my two-year-old son loved it, loved swiping. Uh, love you know love watching things on it. Um, there was no app store. Uh, there were no notifications. It was just a tool that you used when you wanted it. And then in 2008, you get the software development kits, which allow apps to allow developers to develop apps. You get the app store. You get notifications. Uh, in 2010, you get the front-facing camera. So now young people's lives are not just taking photos of each other, but of themselves much more often. Selfies become much a much bigger deal. Instagram is founded in 2010, but it doesn't become popular until 2012 when Facebook buys it. Um, High-speed internet, uh, you know, the early internet was really slow. And it's in this period around 2010 to 2012, that's when we're really moving quickly to high-speed internet and unlimited data plans. Before then, teens had to conserve their texting because they were paying for each text. My point is, in 2010, most teens, the great majority had a flip phone, limited data, no front-facing camera, they used the phone to text each other and to call. That was it. By 2015, most teens, 70 or over 70%, have a smartphone. Most have an Instagram account, especially the girls. They have high-speed data plans. And so now it's possible for the first time to be online all the time. The millennials couldn't do that. Gen Z could and did. And you call Gen Z the anxious generation. That's the title of your book. So tell us who is the yeah. anxious generation? What marks the beginning in your mind? And how did we get here? Yeah. So uh, the way that the way that I discovered this was originally through the work of Jean Twenge. She wrote a book called iGen. And she had an Atlantic article where, you know, so author people need to understand authors don't make up their own titles. The Atlantic is very good at making up titles that will sell. They made up the title, have smartphones destroyed a generation. And so because it was a kind of an over-the-top title, um, Jean took a lot of flack for that. A lot of psychologists criticized her because what she was showing was these graphs of, of mental health, of let's say mental illness, of depression, anxiety, were like little hockey sticks. Like they were flat and then they go up in 2013, 2014, and 2015. And I thought, wow, three years of data? Yeah, I see the, I see the upturn. But if this goes down next year, she's going to be really embarrassed. It didn't go down. 
it just kept going up and up and up, and it's continued going up ever since. So um, the teen mental health crisis began in 2013. That's when all the numbers begin going up. In 2011, there's no sign of a problem. 2013, 2014 is when everything goes up. But it takes us a while to notice it because, you know, we researchers, we don't get the data the day it's collected. It takes like two years before you see the published paper. Um, and uh, But we began to notice on campus around 2014, 2015, that all of our mental health centers were flooded. We couldn't keep up with the demand. And so the, at the time, we thought our students were millennials. People were telling us, oh, yeah, the millennial generation, you know, born 1981 through 1999 or 2000. Nobody really knew. But it turns out that if you were born in 1996 or 7, you have much higher odds of being anxious and depressed than if you were born in 1992 or 93. It's that sudden. It's the most sudden change I've ever seen in longitudinal data. Um, and I think it's because the millennials went through puberty on the early internet. Puberty is an incredibly important period of brain development. The brain is really rewiring itself into a final adult locked down configuration. Millennials went through with flip phones and the early internet and they came out fine. Their mental health is good. Um, Gen Z, I think, is defined by the fact that they went through puberty on social media many hours a day. And that messes you up socially, developmentally, and I think neurologically. And I know that's part of your thesis in the book, but there is another component of your argument in the anxious gen as well. Will you talk, talk to us a little bit about what that is? Ah, uh, yes, thank you. Because everyone's so interested in the phones because that's all front and center. Um, but actually my story is not a simple story about, oh, those kids, they got phones and then they were ruined. It's actually a two-part story. Uh, I can summarize the whole book by saying, we have overprotected our children in the real world and we have underprotected them online. So my previous book <clears throat> was called The Coddling of the American Mind, um, How Good Intentions and Bad Ideas Are Setting Up a Generation for Failure. I wrote that with my friend Greg Lukianoff. Uh, and we spent a lot of time, we were trying to understand why are college students suddenly so fragile uh, beginning in 2015, it wasn't like this in 2012, 2013. Why are college students so fragile that many think they're being harmed if a visiting speaker comes that they don't like, if there's a book assigned that they think has difficult content? The, the students in 2014, 2015 were just different from those, um, um, from those before. Um, so we were looking especially at overprotection. Um, a large part of our argument was we were drawing on play researchers such as Peter Gray and the work of Lenore Skenazy, who wrote this wonderful book, Free Range Kids. Um, and we argued that because children are anti-fragile, that was a key word in that book, um, we're not, kids are not fragile. They're not going to break if they experience a setback. Actually, they need to experience setbacks. It's like the immune system. The immune system, if you protect a kid from dirt and germs, the immune system can't develop because the immune system requires disease, germs, bacteria in order to develop and become strong. Um, so the story that I tell in The Anxious Generation uh, is that childhood was always based on play, especially unsupervised, vigorous, outdoor, rough and tumble play, pretend play, all kinds of play, kids playing with each other without adult supervision so that they learn how to regulate their behavior, they learn how to resolve conflicts. Play is what all mammals do. And in the 1980s and 90s, Americans began to freak out about child abduction. We thought if we ever let our kids out, they'll be kidnapped. So we cracked down on childhood independence. Um, in the 90s, we largely stopped letting them out. And so by about 2010, no one has seen a child outdoors without a chaperone in so long that some neighbors begin calling the police when they see a child outdoors without a chaperone. So we cracked down on free play, which I think interfered with development. But, and this is the millennials we're talking about now, they didn't get to play outside as much, but they're not depressed and anxious yet. So the story I tell is that that weakened them, that made them more fragile. And then when they are thrown into the, the whirlpool of social media, and people say bad things about each other, and you're exposed to all kinds of horrible, horrible content, um, that's, when, that's when adolescents really were easily broken. And that, I think, is Gen Z. I'm so curious about this. So I'm listening to some of your language and hearing words like broken and um, 
thinking about the idea that a generation is ruined and I'm trying to reconcile it with some of my own experiences with mm -hmm. this generation, teens who are amazing. And um, and I'm, I'm wondering, as you were choosing this title, as you were thinking about this framing, you're a psychologist and you were choosing this language, the this term, the anxious generation. Did you have any concern that branding the, the current generation this way would be sort of a self-fulfilling prophecy for teens? Oh, self-fulfilling prophecy no that i didn't i didn't worry about that um because i meant it as a as a call to action now first i should say my original title that i proposed was kids in space um and it was going to be about what happens when you take kids out of planet earth you know like plants need soil if you try to raise them in the air they're almost all going to die um and we took kids out of communities and we raised them in in cyberspace and and so that was my original title it was just kids in space uh, but the publishers rightly pointed out that, you know, that nobody's going to know what that means. And, um, and they came up with the title, The Anxious Generation. But I think it's a good title. Um, the book is actually not even really addressed to young people. Um, it's really addressed to adults and teachers because we need to change what we're doing very, very quickly. Uh, I'm not here to try to play a long game of persuading people over five or ten years that, you know, I'm here to say, look, all, the parents all see the problem. The teachers see, not all. Okay. You and I are both professors. I need to be more careful. I need to be precise in my language. Um, not everyone sees the problem, but I think most do by now. Um, so I'm trying to uh, raise the call that something has gone terribly wrong. I should be clear in response to your question. Most kids are doing fine. The majority of Gen Z are not depressed and anxious. Um, so I, I, you know, if we say destroyed or broken, I don't mean that literally everyone, not even a majority. However, I do think that the majority were influenced in ways that might make them a little, a little weaker, a little less confident. Um, um, so speaking as a social scientist, if you see gigantic differences in mental illness between generations, you know, you and I, we're, we're, we're good at looking at averages and standard deviations and saying, is this a small effect or a big effect? Mm -hmm. These are really big effects statistically in terms of the difference between generations. So, sorry, that was a kind of a convoluted answer. Um, but that's how it came to be called the anxious generation. And they use the word so much. Anxiety is one of the main words they use, even more than depression. Anxiety is the central, uh, it's the central mental illness, and it's a big part of a lot of their identities. So I'm not worried that this is going to cause them to be more anxious. The things coming out of their phones where people are glamorizing it, that, that's what would cause it. For sure. I hear you on that. And t talk to us a little bit about some of the recommendations you have in the book about what you think it's going to take for us to, as you say, like bring kids back to earth. I know you have some very specific, mm -hmm. um, four specific reforms that you'd like to see. Talk to us about what they are and how you got there. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll do that. And then and then I actually want to ask you, because you wrote a book on this, and I want to actually get a contrary view from you. So I'll, I'll do that in just a moment. Okay. But here, okay, here we go. Um, the uh, So the four norms that I propose, uh, I propose simple norms, because we're stuck in a series of collective action problems. You know, it's not it's no good to tell a parent, just don't give your kid an iPhone. Because if you're the only one who doesn't give your kid an iPhone, then she's cut off, she's isolated, she's alone, and that really could be bad for her. But what if what if a bunch of parents um, whose kids are friends, what if a group of us decide, you know what, we're just going to give our kids flip phones. They don't need a smartphone in sixth grade, seventh grade, eighth grade. We're just going to wait till high school before we give mm -hmm. them a smartphone. Well, now, if all your friends have smartphones, have, have flip phones, even if there's only 10 of you in a grade of 50 kids, you're fine. Especially if you're also given more free play, more time to hang out together, because that's a lot more fun. Hanging out with your friends, going to get ice cream, riding your bicycles. That's a lot more fun than sitting alone on your bed, liking people's posts. So anyway, the four norms are these. Um, no smartphones before high school. No social media before 16. Um, Phone-free schools. And far more... Uh, independence, free play, and responsibility in the real world. If we're going to take, if we're going to greatly reduce screen time, especially in K through eight, that's where a lot of the damage is done. That's where we can easily reduce phone use. Uh, if we're going to reduce uh, screen time, we have to give them back fun and joy and time to play and time with each other. So th this is all about trying to roll back the phone-based childhood 
and restore the play-based childhood. I really appreciate that. I'm, I'm wondering, I know you've been talking about these four reforms. What has the response been like from different people who you've engaged in some of these ideas? The response has been incredible. Um, I have been involved in many social change efforts. I ran a gun control group in college. Miserable. We, you know, we made no progress. Um, um, I have advised political campaigns on, you know, how do you adjust language to persuade people. It's very hard to change people's minds. Um, here, what I've discovered is I have no opposition. No, no one is saying that I'm wrong. There are there are a few other researchers. There is an there's a, a good healthy academic debate. There are some who say the effects are tiny. The evidence of causation is not certain. <clears throat> but the the great look the great majority of parents, teachers, Gen Z, they see this. And so I'm finding, I don't have to persuade anyone. Um, I've done a huge amount of work. I, I show my work. I've put up all the research online on my Substack stack, afterbabble.com. Uh, we've collected you know, probably a thousand studies by now and organized them. We've created dozens or hundreds of graphs and charts. So I've done the work to persuade anyone who needs persuading. But the surprise for me has been as as the book is coming out, as people are reading it, no one is pushing back. There's nobody saying I'm wrong. There's nobody saying I, I got things wrong. Um, I just gave a, a talk uh, a, a, an hour or two ago to a high school uh, in Texas, a remote talk. Um, they strongly endorsed the norms. Um, so the response has been unlike anything I've ever seen. And people want to change. I think people are hungry and ready for a change. I'm, I'm so curious about that in part because, so I saw some data just out of the National Parents Union that um, I think this was from last week, suggesting that a majority of parents actually don't want K-12 schools going phone free. And I was kind of surprised by that. Curious mm -hmm. how, how, you, how you're thinking about that and if mm -hmm. there is any kind of pushback to in particular the sort of phone bans in schools that we might need yes. to engage with as we think about okay. implementation. All right. Thank you for pushing back. You're right. There is one objection. It's the only one that comes up for phone-free schools. It's school shooters. That's the objection. And so, you know, you as a parent, what if someone said to you, what would your first thought be if the school said, your kid can't have a phone in school? What would your first thought be? <laughs> uh, well, I feel like I'm not a great use case for this argument, but I okay. think... <laughs> okay. Back to your right. Sorry. But I take Again, your I point. I take your point. Yeah. Okay. For most, for most parents... For most mothers in particular, what do you think the first thought would be? Uh, you know, okay, uh, rhetorical question. I think it would be, what, but what if there's a problem? I, I, I need to be able to reach my child. So I think that's become a natural reaction because we're so paranoid. We've become such paranoid parents. There's even a wonderful book called Paranoid Parenting mm -hmm. by Frank Ferrady. So if you have people who are, uh, you have a lot of people who are paranoid, so their first thought is, what if there's a school shooter? What if there's, uh, uh, you know, some issue? I need to be able to reach my child right away. So, okay, this will take some persuasion. And the argument goes like this. Um, we're, we've gotten used to talking to our children all the time, and we've seen horrible school shootings. And, and it, for every parent, it's an unimaginable, I mean, it's, we, we, we can't, sometimes we can't keep it out of our minds. It really is, hits home. But if your kid is going to go to a school, would you rather it be a school in which everyone has a phone, and as soon as there's a lockdown, half the kids are on their phone, calling their parents, crying, they're loud, they're afraid, they're not listening, the teacher can't get their attention. Do you want your kid in that school? Or do you want your kid in a school where no one has a phone other than the teacher? And the teacher is telling them what to do, and people are quiet, and they're cooperating, and they're focused on what's happening around them. So experts on school security do not advocate phones. Some of them have come out saying um, phone-free schools are better, that you know, the phones are, are a problem. Um, so I think it will take a little bit of time to reassure people on that. Um, but I think what's been happening is that the parents who are very upset about not being able to contact their kid during math class, they're, they're in the principal's face. They're the ones who are saying, don't mm -hmm. you do this? How can you do this? But I think that um, I, I think that it pretty soon most parents will be very open and supportive of the idea of well, you know, if if everyone's doing this and if there is a way I can get in touch with my kid, I can call the office and if there's an emergency, they can get the kid. Um, I think uh, I think people are going to come around very very quickly. Schools that have gone phone free universally have an amazing experience. I put out on a call, a call on Twitter 
can anyone find a story about a school that went phone free and regretted it? Mm. No one. No one can find such a story. Interesting. And I love that this is actually such a researchable question. I think we will see more schools making this kind of decision and then we'll be able to see what happens and we'll have some data yeah. to really think through together. That's um, right. right. And the UK just did it. The UK uh, and a number of other countries have mandated phone free schools. The state of Florida just mandated it. So it is happening. We're at a tipping point. It is going to happen. And since every time you do it, the kids themselves say, wow, school's a lot more fun, you know, because in between classes, if the kids have phones in between classes, there's silence. Everyone's checking their texts and, and DMs. But when they don't have phones, kids talk and joke and laugh and flirt and do the things that you and I remember kids doing between classes. <laughs> they say the okay, mean wait, things here's in a post-it note. Okay. <laughs> Here's what I was. I want. I, I want to ask you because I because I, I bought your book behind the screens when I began this project. And I was like, oh, this book looks great. And then you know, as it is, you have so many books. I didn't. I really regret to say I didn't actually read it. But uh, but my sense from from what I saw about it, my sense is that you take a much more nuanced view than I do about the pluses and minuses. Is that you see many more benefits um, to kids, let's say in middle school, being on Instagram. Is that true? Well, I think we have somewhat different aims. And so I would say it's true that we take a more nuanced view for sure. The reason is because I, when we were right, when Carrie and I were writing that book, our approach was we talked to many, many kids, thousands of kids across the country. And we asked them questions like, what is it like for you to grow up with social media and smartphones? And we were really interested in the things that were hard. And we write a lot about the struggles that kids described. But one of the reasons that we focus so much on, there are actually really two reasons why we are so interested in the details. I think one is that we see that kids are just not having a monolithic experience of tech. You know, we have, okay. we have teens living Fair. in yeah. so many different circumstances yeah. and context and um, and hearing kids stories it felt like mm -hmm. it felt like that was a really important part of making sense of what was going on sort of mm -hmm. mapping the terrain um, and the second is I'm I'm also really interested in what kinds of interventions we need and I have found it super interesting listening to teens really closely and then thinking about what their experiences reveal around what might be helpful at sort of a more granular level. Like what is hard about this and what could we do as adults to um, to help? And and one of the things that is really that really stood out to me is that so often I think that um, the screen time fights have become a real us versus them battle between kids and yeah. adults. Yeah. And so I've been really interested. I think kids really need adults in their lives who are caring and, and empathetic and helping with boundaries and supporting skill development. And I've been just so interested in what it looks like to build kids agency and also build those relationships mm -hmm. between kids and adults so that they have us there as the guides that I know that they so desperately need. Okay. Okay, that, that all sounds fair. That sounds like very important work. That certainly will be helpful to parents. Um, I just want to know, what, what is your sense about, it, 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 well, so re about the age at which kids should be allowed to open accounts on sites like Instagram and TikTok? Right oh, now, the current <laughs> age is 13 and it's not enforced. I'm saying it should be 16 and enforced. What, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, I think I read your description on, well, let's let's explain to people, how, why are we at 13 in the first place? I think this is really important yeah. context for yes. people to have. This was it a political is. compromise, not a developmentally motivated decision. Will you give yes. everyone a bit of, just a bit of context sure. on why we're here? Sure. So uh, back in the beginning of the internet in the 90s, you had companies that were collecting data from people. You had AOL. Um, and a lot of these people were children. And Congress was tasked with figuring out well, what's the law going to be? Can companies just take whatever they want from a seven-year-old mm -hmm. and sell it? Like, what's, what are we going to do? And so uh, Ed Markey, now Senator Markey, he was then Representative Markey from Massachusetts, um, he, he proposed a bill. It, it came to be called COPPA, the Child, uh, Childhood Online Privacy Protection Act. It was passed in 1998, I believe. Um, and he, in his original bill, it said, well, 16. He thought 16, you know, I mean, 18 is the obvious choice uh, at which kids can sign contracts and they're adults. But he thought, you know, the way the internet is going, you know, at 16, you should be able to be on AOL and talking to strangers and, and giving away your data without your parents' knowledge or permission. You are treated as an adult on the internet, 16. So he proposes this. And then, of course, the, the tech companies hate it. And, you know, I don't know if it was AOL, but whichever ones uh, were the ones that were being limited here with their access to children. They hated it. They opposed it. 
and they teamed up. They were able to find some allies uh, uh, who were advocating for children's rights. You know, what if what if a uh, what if a thirteen year old wants to get an abortion? Should she not be able to, uh, you know, go on anonymously? So you had this interesting coalition of sort of you know business and sort of progressive activists saying, no, no, sixteen is too high. Let's make it thirteen. And then the way the bill was written, it's thirteen, but the companies have no responsibility whatsoever to verify that. It, it, they are not liable at all for underage use if they don't know that the child is underage. And that's why they say, what is your birthday? And that's it. They don't mm -hmm. want to know anything else. And now, of course, Facebook knows everything about us. All these programs, I mean, they know how old kids are. Um, when my kids entered uh, middle school, sixth grade in New York City schools, they both said the same thing. Everyone is on Instagram. Can I have an Instagram account? So, um, so the reason why all the sixth graders are on Instagram when they're not 13 uh, is because of this bill. Uh, and that was the only protection Congress has ever given to children. And it was essentially zero protection. It did nothing. That's the only thing Congress has ever done in the entire history of the internet. And now, of course, a lot of us are pushing, can't you at least make it a little bit safer? Can't you at least pass COSA, the Kids Online Safety mm -hmm. Act? Let's, can we do anything? Or are we going to continue to have our kids sextorted and, and, and harassed and approached by strange men and sold drugs? I mean, it's completely untenable, the current situation where every child is exposed to everything that could possibly exist with the parents unable to stop it unless they lock the kid in a room with no Internet. Yeah, we agree. This this is <laughs> the, the status yes. quo is not All working. Right. So um, I think and I think it's really important you just teed up. So so people who are watching might be curious. So there are really two things that are that are topics for discussion right now in the political space. I mean, one is that right now, 13 is effectively the age of adulthood on the Internet. And um, we're, we're just there essentially as a political compromise. That's how we got here. The second is that there's no actual verification. So it's sort of like a yeah, yeah, I'm 13. But you could be any age. So we're talking about, one, should the age of internet adulthood be raised? And two, should we have actual verification required? And I know you talk a little bit about this in your book. Um, tell us about where you came down in terms of your thinking about age verification and this broader mm -hmm. debate. Yeah. So, I mean, it's completely, I think it's completely obvious to most people that Pornhub and pornography sites shouldn't just be open to anybody who can reach a computer. You know, a, a seven-year-old boy can can go to Pornhub. Um, some of the sites don't even ask, are you 13? They don't even make you lie. They just say, okay, you're here, welcome. This is completely insane. Um, and so if, if there were not privacy concerns, if there were not technical obstacles, it seems completely obvious to me that we should have at least um, age verification for pornography, um, you know, to buy all sorts, to buy certain things that you can't buy in a physical store. Um, we have a hundred years of experience making the physical world safe so that adults and children can live in them. We can drive in cars and we have special seats for kids. Mm -hmm. um, we've been, and we brought the death rate down, you know, 90%. I mean, the world is, the physical world is incredibly safe for children compared to even when, I don't know how old you are, but I'm, I'm 60. Growing up in the 70s, there were a lot more dangers. Um, how, how old are you, Emily? 35. Well, I shouldn't ask that. I shouldn't ask that. Whatever. <laughs> I don't mind. Um, I, are you, <laughs> yeah, okay, fine. You're, I, I assume you're younger <laughs> than me. Um, <clears throat> all right, in any case, um, so it seems obvious to me that, you know, it took a long time to make the physical world safe so that adults could do what they want and kids could do what they want without getting too badly hurt, you know, fences around pools, all sorts of things. The internet is new, and I understand that it took a while. It's going to take a while to put up guardrails. But, you know, it's been around for like 30 years now, and there are zero guardrails. There's nothing whatsoever, nothing to protect children. And the stories that we're hearing now, you know, like I just read a horrible one in Wired magazine, um, you know, th these gangs of, of perverts and weirdos that will trick a girl into sending us a, a, nude, uh, a nude photo of herself because she thinks she's flirting with a boy. And then they reveal themselves to be a, a group of men who are, who are sick uh, and who blackmail her into degrading herself, cutting their names into her thigh, uh, in one in one case, they made her cut off the head of her pet hamster while they watched and laughed. And then they said, now for the last thing we want you to do, and of course, with everything, they said, if you don't do it, we're going to show all of these videos to everyone you know. We are going to humiliate you. And this is death to a, to a teenager, to anyone, but especially to a teenager. And they said, and for the final act, we'd like you to kill yourself on camera. 
And it was finally at that point that she told her mother, she broke down and told her mother, and then they were able to put a stop to it. But this is not a one-off thing. There are many of these gangs. Uh, God, we don't know how many victims they've had, but this is not like some free, uh, this is not like a media panic where this thing happened and therefore we need to change our laws. No, this, uh, this is happening. Sextortion, not to 1% of kids, but it's not like one in a million. It's, it, um, so, so the idea that you know, a 10, 11 year old girl can wander into this without her parents' knowledge or consent, that you can talk to naked men who are masturbating on Omegly or whatever it's called. I mean, this is completely insane. Omegle. Yeah. So, so I just, you know, I want to sort of get the gut feelings going here that what we're doing is completely ridiculous. And now let's look at the other side. The other side is, all right, but you know, if you're going to verify ages, then my privacy might be compromised because what am I going to do? Show you my driver's license? And what if you're hacked? People will know that I came to your site. Okay, those are legitimate points. Um, but my argument is uh, Congress shouldn't mandate a single way of doing age verification. Congress should just mandate the goal. That's what it should have done back in 1998. Say, mm -hmm. you know, here's the law. The age is 16. And you guys figure it out. You figure it out. We don't expect you to be perfect. We're not going to make you liable if one kid gets in. But, you know, as long as you're reasonably effective, you're covered for underage use. Um, and there are already so many different ways of doing age verification. There are so many companies doing it for financial products um, that they have their own trade association, you know, age verification association something. Mm -hmm. So there are many different ways of doing it, but besides showing a driver's license. So it is doable. Um, it is essential. Uh, and I think we're going to have to get to the point of realizing, you know, we have to do on the internet what we did in the real world. We have to have a world in which adults can do largely what they want to do, kids can do what they want to do, um, and uh, the kids don't get chewed up in the process. For sure, we need a, a much different and much safer kind of internet for kids. I, as a as a parent, it's hard for me to even listen to you tell that story. Honestly, I feel like my my blood pressure is like sweating listening yeah. to listening to that story mm -hmm. and imagining my daughter in a situation like that. So I, I think a lot of parents will understand that. I want to, um, that evokes my desire for, for keeping my daughter safe and for that kind of safetyism that you talked about in the book mm -hmm. so much. And I want to ask you specifically about this idea you talk about in the book about, um, how about experience blockers? And you talk about phones as mm -hmm. experience blockers, and you talk about our our overprotection of kids as experience blockers. And I'm wondering, I found this so interesting, and I'm wondering if you can just talk a little bit about what you mean, how we got there, and if you could just fit into that, how I can lean into the benefits of risky play with my kids yeah. without yeah. ending up in the emergency room every week. <laughs> that would be great, right. too. <laughs> yeah, that's right. right. Well, first, let me just make the point that um, you know, my my goal here is not to just panic parents about the internet because I don't want them to be afraid of everything. <clears throat> but I, I I tell stories like that to illustrate the fact that you know we're also afraid that our our children outdoors will be they'll run into a sex criminal or a sex predator or something like that. And I tell that story because the sex predators aren't out at playgrounds. They're really not out there. You don't hear stories about that. The, the the guys who are out at playgrounds, they've all been arrested and locked away for life. And there are, you know, or they're on extreme restrictions as sex predators. Um, so they're not out there. They're all on Instagram. The sex predators are all on Instagram and a few other platforms. That's where it's easy and safe for them to contact young, uh, contact children. So I do want people to realize we've completely overinvested in our defense portfolio in the real world, where we're vastly overspending with negative results. And we've completely underinvested in protecting our kids online where we're not doing anything. I mean, some are, many are trying and struggling, but we're not very effective. And we need to do a lot more and we need help from Congress and from norms. So um, now to your question. Um, so, you know, after I wrote that first chapter about the graphs and the data and what the hell happened, I, I felt like, wow, you know, I better, I better write a whole chapter just on childhood so people understand, like, what is it that these phones are preventing us from doing as kids? Mm -hmm. And once I laid that out, you know, I, uh, again, I'm not a developmental psychologist, but I study evolution and culture. Um, and I'm interested in, in develop, moral development around the world. Uh, and so I think a lot about how does a child go, how does a boy become a man? How does a girl become a woman? How is that handled all over the world? Um, and, you know, kids need a huge amount of experience. They have a, a huge curiosity, a hunger to understand the world, not maybe through books, but through direct experience. Um, and 
when you, I'm sure many parents have had this experience. You're traveling, you're in this amazing place. You want to go see a waterfall or go see this amazing thing. And your kid just wants to sit there on, on her iPad in the hotel room. Um, my wife and I found that, you know, when we went to, you know, a, a nice uh, hotel in you know, upstate New York, it was only when we just locked away the, the, the phones and the iPads, just locked them away. So, no, you cannot have these until we, until we leave, the, leave the hotel, you know, that our kids really like opened up and started enjoying the facilities. Um, so kids need a huge amount of experience. The best is self-directed, unsupervised. Um, and it turns out the best of the best actually has some element of risk. One of the essential tasks that kids have to manage is, is recognizing risk and managing it for themselves. And if you protect them from risk all the time, you, you make the decisions about what's risky. They never learn to do that. And that's part of what happened with Gen Z when they showed up in college in 2014, 2015. And many of them were like, this book is dangerous. This book is going to hurt people. They're like, mm -hmm. what? what how, can a, I don't, how, can a book, how can a speaker hurt people if you don't even have to go to their talk? Like, what are you talking about? Um, so we really deprived our kids of the experience of risk. Um, now, there's really wonderful work uh, by some play researchers, including one from Norway, Ellen Sandseter, mm -hmm. who has a couple of essays on how kids need risky play because taking risks and experiencing fear and then overcoming it is literally the way kids overcome anxiety. And this really helps explain, many parents will have seen, if you take your kid to an amusement park, you take a bunch of kids to an amusement park, um, they're not just going to be like, oh, I don't want to do anything scary. No, it's, it's a, the opposite, actually. It's about like, okay, which roller coaster are you going to try? You know, and here in New York City, you know, there's a, uh, you know, there's like the Soaring Eagle, there's the Steeplechase. I mean, there's a bunch. And then there's like, oh, shoot, what's the big one? Uh, well, obviously the, the Cyclone, but there's, an, you know, there's, a, there's a bunch of them. Uh, and then there's the Slingshot, which I'm even scared to do. But the point is, the kids spend a lot of time talking about it. And some of them are ready to try, you know, cyclone at a certain age or slingshot. Um, and you can see they're like, it's like they're in a chemistry lab titrating the exact amount of fear that they're ready for. And if they pick something that's a little scary and they're scared just before launch, I remember that feeling from childhood, being really scared as the roller coaster is just going over the top of the hill. It's scary. And then it's thrilling. And then when you come out at the other end, you're jumping up and down and you are now a stronger, tougher kid. You have overcome your fear. You had the feeling of thrills and you are on your way to being less anxious as an adult. If you do that thousands of times, you will be much less anxious as an adult. So kids need a huge range of experiences. Some percentage of them should ideally involve fear. Some should involve social ex exclusion and conflict. Um, and if we look at this varied diet of experience and we say, how about if we cut down the total number of experiences by 70%? Let's just give them 70% less experience. And let's make sure none of it has any risk or fear or threat. What do you think? Like, you know, we all want to protect our kids from danger, but who would pick that? Who would choose to deprive their kid of the full range of human experience? And unfortunately, that's what we've done. Once a kid gets a phone, not every kid, you know, some kids, they can take it or leave it. But a lot of kids, especially girls on social media and boys on video games, once you give them the device, if you don't really put strong, clear limits on, it will expand like a gas to fill every available moment of their day. And I, I, as you were describing the roller coasters, I, I think most viewers will probably be in this position. I was imagining, I was remembering going on this roller coaster, the Hulk at like age 11. And that is such a mm -hmm. visceral memory for me. Yes. I want to go back to something. And it's a positive you, memory. It's a happy yeah, memory, it, right? Yeah, it is. It's well, thrilling. it is. Although, you know, I, I, I wrote it so many times back to back. I think I was ill afterwards and that's what stands <laughs> out. But I think there was also yeah. some confidence that came with that. Um, mm -hmm. I want to go back to something you shared a few minutes ago. So you were talking about um, going on vacation and the sort of importance of locking, the idea of what, what opened up when the phones, the kids' phones were locked mm -hmm. in the room. And that just makes me think about something I feel like I've heard from a lot of teens, which is that they wish that their parents would lock the parents' phones in the room, that they, they yes. wish that yeah. they could have their parents' undivided attention. And I'm wondering mm -hmm. as we think about, as we think about moving forward and as we think about what it will take to get to a better, a better state mm -hmm. of affairs, what yeah. role do we have as, as adults and as parents to mm -hmm. reflect on, think about, look critically at our own tech habits? Yeah, that is, that is a question that many have raised. And I think my answer is gonna be a little counterintuitive, which is, I don't think parents are actually 
that important by the time kids are in middle school. Now, obviously they're important for many reasons, but what I'm getting at is this. When the kids are little, they're really focused on their parents and playing with their parents and back and forth games and songs and jokes. And it's really fun. I mean, that's one of the great things about being a dad is, you know, you really, it's, you're, you're, you're Mr. Play. Um, and so what, what you're doing, you know, what the parents are doing when the kids are, you know, one, two, three, four, five years old, I think that does matter a lot. Um, and a lot of parents are giving what's called continuous partial attention mm -hmm. to their toddlers and their children. They're trying to do their email. They're trying to cook dinner. They're kind of pretending to be going along with the game and they're not doing a good job of any of it. This is bad for all of us. So for kids in elementary school and before, I do think, um, we'd be better off, um, even if you spend less total time with your child, make that time be time when you're when you're really engaged as person to person, face to face, turn taking, fully present. By the time kids get to middle school, they don't care very much about what you want them to do or what you think. They are completely obsessed with what everybody else thinks. Uh, they would never wear a pair of sneakers that you bought them that you thought were great if they think others will make fun of them. So if you, ha if you tell me, we can either do this, we can either work on parents so that they don't spend as much time on their phone and they model good behavior. Let's see if we can reduce the mental health crisis by having parents model good behavior. I don't think that's going to turn it around at all. If the other kids are on Instagram in sixth and seventh grade, they're going to be on Instagram in sixth and seventh grade. It doesn't matter what their parents are doing. Um, whereas um, if we could come up with a norm in which we parents all get together and we say no smartphone till high school, that I think would be transformative. That would be such a big effect. Just delay the craziness, delay it until it, let, let them at least get through early puberty. So of course, parents matter for many things, you know, but as you know, a lot of the research um, on personality just continues to show that personality is not really shaped by the parents. It's shaped by genes and it's shaped by peers and culture. Um, but they're not really looking to us for, they're not copying us by the time they're in middle school, they're copying their peers. It feels like, it feels like if not the modeling though, the, the connection, I mean, parents do still matter so much to middle schoolers. And I'm thinking about, I, I just read Jenny Wallace's book, Never Enough. And I'm thinking about her, her arguments about mattering and how important it yeah. is for, for our kids during the teen years to know that they matter to others yes. and to us. And yes. it feels like that is part of what happens when we are constantly distracted and, and our kids, mm -hmm. I, I know from teens, they're noticing yes. that and they're feeling it. Okay. Okay. There, I 100% agree. Let's talk about this, about mattering. That is a great word. Um, so, right. What I was saying is parents don't necessarily matter as role models as much, but they're very important from an attachment perspective. The kid needs a secure base. They need to trust their parent. They need to know that if things go bad, they have a place to go. If someone's trying to force them to kill themselves on camera, they can go to an adult who's going to support them and not scream at them. Not just um, can, so of need course, to, right? Not just, the, not just that they can go yeah, to an that's adult, right. they, but that's that they, is they, absolutely... That, that, that's right. Yeah. So, uh, so yeah, I, I certainly am not saying parents don't matter. I would never say that. Um, I'm just saying teens aren't copying them so much. Now, your word mattering is fantastic because what's, what's happening, especially for boys, what's happening is they feel that they are useless. And there are these questions on monitoring the future. Uh, sometimes I, I, you know, what is it? Sometimes I feel like my life has no meaning or I feel that I am useless. Um, and how much do you agree or disagree with this question? And these numbers, the agreement with that was actually going down a little bit in the 2000s. But those things, everything about despair, uselessness, those all do a hockey stick curve up. They all rise very quickly after around 2012. Kids, as soon as they get, as soon as they move their lives online, they feel useless. So I've been thinking about this. We got these graphs in the book. And two nights ago, I was in, uh, I was in Austin, Texas, um, and, I, and I was taking the, you know, the, uh, an Uber uh, to, the, to the airport. And, you know, we're making small talk with the driver. And I said, oh, I'm here to promote a book. He says, oh, what's the book on? And rather than telling him what it was about, I said, well, it's, you know, it's about what's happening to your generation. So he was young. He was uh, 28 or 20. Yeah, he was 20, 28, I think. So uh, older Gen Z. Um, and, and I said, well, well, you know, what do you think is happening? Oh, you know, you know, I, you know we, got, we got problems, you know, a lot with depression. We're, you know, anxious. We're, we're, not, and we're not doing so well economically. So he had a list of litanies. And, and I said, what do you think is, what do you think is causing it? Why, are, why is your generation so unhappy? And the first thing he said was, you know, I think a lot of us, especially the boys, they just feel useless. They feel like 
you know, like the world doesn't really value them for anything. And then he used this phrase. I, I, I wrote it down. I should find it. But it was basically he said, because I said, OK, what do you mean? You know, uh, 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 you know, what do you mean you said, tell me more? And I, I think what he said was um, y- you just need to feel that you mean something to someone. Um, you know, just that you yeah. you are connected you in matter. a way. That, yeah, that you, that you matter. That's right. And and so I don't think it's it's not just that your parents are paying attention. Although, no, of course, that it, you, right. if your parents aren't even listening to you, if they're saying, you know what? This text coming is more important than you. You don't matter. So you're right. In, in that way, if parents convey you don't matter, that is bad. I do agree with that. Yeah, it's, it's, it's so interesting to just to think about this and to think about what role, which is really what you're trying to parse and what role is social media really playing here and what else is going on. I hope, you know, I, I, I hope that people will pay attention, not just to the tech side of your book, but to the other piece of what you're writing here about independence and about um, supporting play. And I love your description of play clubs and schools and some of the interventions like that that are really actionable. Um, and, and I hope that that will be part of the discussion around this book as well. I certainly hope so. So let me now put in, uh, you know, for turning more towards specific things that, that people can do, that parents can do. Um, I hope anybody, especially if your kids are still in, in K through eight or just you know, younger than high school, especially, I hope you'll go to letgrow.org. Um, it's a small organization founded by Lenore Skenazy, who wrote Free Range Kids, um, and me and Peter Gray, a, a play researcher. Uh, and it offers all kinds of ways to help you let grow, to help you step back, give your kids some independence. Um, and we also especially find it powerful. We work through schools. So our, if, if, if you don't mind, I'd love to just briefly Please. explain this one yeah. project that is so powerful. It's called the Let Grow Experience. It gets right to what you were just asking about, about how do parents do this. So um, I'm a big fan of sending kids out on errands. And, um, you know, when I kids were in fourth grade, and maybe even third, we started sending them just like across the street to a supermarket. Um, and, but you know, a lot, but that's because I was friends with Lenore Skenazy. When I moved to New York City in 2011, my wife and I met her and we were really influenced by her book, Free Range Kids. So we were pushing our kids out to do things and they loved it. They really felt more confident. They were proud of themselves. Their friends weren't doing this, but they were. But it's hard, especially if, if no other kids are out there. So, uh, what this was it, actually the project was invented by a teacher at Brooklyn Tech, but Lenore and I put it up uh, at Let Grow. It's called the Let Grow Experience. It's a homework assignment, and imagine your kid is in you know let's say a third grade class, eight years old, and the assignment the teacher gives is go home, talk with your parents, think of something that you think you can do that you've never done by yourself. And we give examples, like maybe it's walking the dog for the first time. Maybe it's making dinner. Maybe it's going to the store and buying groceries. Maybe it's raking the yard, whatever. Mm -hmm. You know, you come up with something uh, and agree with your parents and you do it. And then, you know, the next week you come in and everybody talks about it and you write down what you did. You put it, it's a little leaf. You put it up on your tree. You have a leaf on your tree. And then you do this every week for 10 or 20 weeks. And after 10 or 20 weeks, so an amazing thing happens even just after the second or third week, which is the kids are often a little nervous about, about going out, especially on their own. But then, like as we were talking about with thrills, they're nervous, they're a little anxious, they do it, it works, they're thrilled, they're like jumping up and down. So now they want to do it again, and they do another one, and another one, another one. So it really affects the kids, but here's the cool thing. It really affects the parents, mm-hmm. because these are often parents that would not let their kid walk three blocks to a store. But if it's a homework assignment, and if everyone's doing it, uh, then actually it's much easier for parents to let go. And if a whole town does it, if every elementary school in the town does it, before you know it, you're seeing eight-year-olds in the grocery store buying milk and carrying it home, just the way my generation and all previous generations used to do. We used to trust seven-year-olds to go shopping, to do errands, to ride their bicycles. We don't do that anymore, but we need to. So the Let Grow experience, I urge parents to try it themselves at home. And if you have any influence on the school your kids go to, it works great in middle school too. So K through eight is a fantastic project. It also works in high school, but it's just, yeah, it's a little bit different. But K through eight, please try the Let Grow project. Go to letgrow.org. 
And John, I love this story in your book where you talk about your daughter bringing you lunch to your office. I felt like I was right there with you, peering down, watching her across the street and trying to yeah. make sure you didn't lose sight of her, but also knowing that that was so important. And I, th I think parents will really resonate with that. Um, I want to I wanna just ask you one other, I hope you don't mind one more maybe slightly critical sure. question Please. as we wrap oh, up. I, I love those. Please push back on me. I want someone to push back. <laughs> okay, I'm ready. I so I had um I had one of my undergrads who works on my team read your book with me when I was preparing for this interview. And it was so interesting. She really resonated with a lot of what you're describing about the um independent, the importance of independence and and play for sure. That was, you know, in her notes and her highlights. She was like, yes, yes, yes. And there were a number of recommendations that was really interesting. She said to me, you know, I felt, um, she's a first-gen college student, and she said, I felt in reading some of the recommendations like they, like, more time in beautiful green spaces and outward bound programs yeah. and gap years abroad. Yeah. And she was like, I just came away feeling yeah. like these things were for recommendations for rich kids. They were like recommendations right. that right. I couldn't have had access to. And yeah. I was thinking about this because so much of you, you know, your argument about bringing kids back to earth, I wondered about the earth that most kids right now actually get to live in and how we actually think about implementation when it requires really acknowledging these, these big inequities in access to the kinds of experiences that we know are so important for positive development. Yeah. Uh, th that is a great, it's not exactly a counter argument, but that certainly is a qualification and nuance uh, that we do attend to in the book. And I say we, because Lenore Skenazy actually helped me to write some of those later chapters with specific advice for parents. And it is true that that some of them are more accessible to parents who are, who are in the upper third of the income distribution than to the lower third. That certainly is true. Um, um, but a lot of it, but put it this way, there is so much concern about inequality and about disadvantaged and underserved kids that a lot of these programs are really available to kids from any income level. So for example, I am a huge fan of summer camp. Summer camp, sleepaway camp, is pretty much the only way you're ever gonna get kids to go phone free for a month. And it's transformative when they do, they get completely detoxed, they lose their addiction. But yes, of course it costs money. Now, for more than 100 years, there have been all kinds of organizations trying to bring kids from, this, from the city, poor kids, immigrant kids, out to camps. There are all kinds of programs. I gave a talk at the Camp Directors Association a couple of months ago in New Orleans, and it was really clear. You know, It's true that most of the kids at camp are middle class and above. Of course, that's true. But most of them have financial aid. Most of them are aware of the problem. They want to bring other kids in. They'll give them a full ride. So there are often, and we talk about this in the book too, for outward bound programs, the state of Connecticut has a great program. Again, making it totally accessible. It's designed actually for kids who are not middle class. So, yes, as a parent, you would have to look for these. As a parent, uh, as a you know working class or poor parent, low SES parent, you would have to look for these. It's true. Um, whereas you know, if you live in a lovely green suburb, you can just go to the local woods or someone's you know two acre backyard. Um, so that is true. Um, but it's especially urgent that they do it and that those of us who can support such things do so because the new dig digital divide is not that uh, rich kids or kids in wealthy families have better computers and more access. That's what we thought in the 90s. Like, oh no, you know, the internet's so important and although you know, the rich kids have access but the poor kids don't, we need to give those kids their own computer. We need to give every kid a computer in class, we thought. And that was a mistake uh, because the, these devices are so distracting and they do so much damage when kids move on to them and become heavy users that the new digital divide is that whatever numbers, whenever you look at some measure of, of screen use, screen time, supervision, um, it's, the well, it's the kids from uh, wealthier families who, who have more limits, more controls, and they use an hour or two less a day of screen time. It's low SES kids, black kids, kids with whose parent who have a single parent. Um, they have a lot more screen use um, and screen time, and so they are being harmed by it more than wealthy kids. I, I think that the digital addictions are actually exaggerating our unequal society and our and our class divide. So we need, yeah, we need to take special efforts and philanthropic efforts to make these opportunities available to all. John, I, I have so many more questions that I want to ask you. I'm getting the cue to wrap. Thank you so much for your attention to this topic. I know we both want to see a happier, healthier generation of teens. And so it's, it's great to have this chance to talk with you about, about your thinking about how we get there. And um, thanks all for joining us.
Well, thank you so much, Emily. I hope listeners will go to uh, anxiousgeneration.com, uh, the website for the book, and afterbabble.com, which is my substack, where I, it's free, and I put out all, all the research supporting uh, and, and investigating what's going on. Thank you. Thanks for listening to this week's Afterwards podcast. If you are interested in podcasts about nonfiction books, listen to C-SPAN's Book Notes Plus podcast for interviews with authors and historians hosted by Brian Lamb.